UNMP is, uh, is, is now pretty old. It's an application programming interface for multi-threaded applications. And it's actually gone a little further than that now, but the idea was we wanted to make things as easy as we could for application programmers to write multi-threaded applications. And so the focus for most of OpenMP's life was how do we make SMP programming with directives as easy and natural as can be. And it was really focused on standardizing common SMP practice. Now over the last several years, it's adding vectorization and heterogeneous programming. So it's moving beyond its multi-threaded roots. But at the core of anyone starting with OpenMP, you really need to start with thinking about the threads. Now, the basic definitions of what we have with OpenMP is the core of OpenMP, you have at the lowest level a collection of processors that share an address space. It just assumes there's a shared address space underneath. On top of that, you have the operating system, and the operating system has some concept of threads. OpenMP says very little about the characteristics of those threads. It just assumes the operating system is going to give you a set of threads. Then on top of that is a runtime, low-level runtime library that the, the OpenMP implementers provide for how you organize and manage those threads. And that's all sitting low-level. That's just the assumed core level. Then we get to the programmer's level. This is where, you know, when you learn OpenMP, this is the layer you learn. And you know, there's a set of directives. And all, most of what you do in OpenMP comes through these directives. And that's what we'll spend most of our time making sure you really understand today. Then there are a set of features that have to happen at runtime. You know, the directive tells the compiler, transform the code to do this following thing. Then there's other stuff where it just has to happen at runtime. So that's in a library. Things like, what's my thread ID? How many threads did you actually give me? So there's a small number of runtime library routines you have to use. And then there's a handful of environment variables. So these are the things you use to manipulate OpenMP. And then on course, on top of that, you have the application and, and, and you have the end user. Now what's happening with OpenMP is we created it with this SMP model in mind. All the processors see a shared address space, and it's symmetric. There's no, there's no different cost function that changes from one processor to another. That's what it means to call something SMP. That's an equal cost function from any processor to any location in memory. Uh, as far as I can tell, the last time an SMP machine was built was the Cray 2. So it's been a long time since we've had actual SMP machines. Real machines are more complicated. And what you have is processors that are close to some memories, processors that are far from memory. So this is the non-uniform memory architecture. And the reality is the real world out there is, is NUMA. Even, even your laptops, which you know, have two or four cores sitting into a shared memory controller out into DRAM, even that's a NUMA machine because you have to take the caches into account, and therefore there is close memory and far memory. So NUMA is the real, the real world. And over the years, you've seen us adding things to OpenMP to try and help you deal with that NUMA-ness. You know, uh, common practice, like initialize the data with the same loop structure that you're going to actually use it to take advantage of the first touch page policies. But now they're adding things like you know, OMP proc bind, uh, teams so you can create you know, uh, 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 legions of teams. So all these other features are making it into OpenMP so we can address the NUMA characters. And then with OpenMP 4.0, we're going off the deep end. <laughs> And we're, we're adding these target directives so we can handle devices. So now you're looking at the host, which is a regular CPU, and you're going to have potentially a GPU or something like a Xeon Phi, or you know, basically these devices that you can access through a target layer. So this is like very, very recent in OpenMP, and you know, that's the direction we're moving as well. So you can see that OpenMP, well, it started in this little SMP core, and frankly, a lot of what we're going to do today is focused on that SMP core. It's rapidly, with each year, growing further and further beyond that to encompass everything that's happening on the node. 
so that OpenMP really becomes your node level programming model, regardless of what you put on that node. And that I think is pretty darn exciting. So the core that syntax of OpenMP is you have these directives. And with C, it's pound, pragma, OMP, then the construct name, and then a collection of clauses. So for example, I might have pound, pragma, OMP, parallel, and then I'm asking num threads, I'm requesting that the system give me four threads. Um, now, it used to be I had a whole bunch of slides here that would talk about what it looks like in Fortran, but over the years, this course has shifted so that it's purely in C, everything we're doing in C. How many of you are primarily Fortran programmers? Wow, okay. But you all read C, right? All right. <laughs> now, that's good. You know, the, the, this is fascinating because in the old days, it was all Fortran that we taught when I did an OpenMP course. Then it became 50-50, and then Fortran went away about 10 years ago. I just, I didn't see people asking for it. So we did, I switched 100% to C. And Fortran is coming back. It's making a resurgence. So it's, it's heartwarming to see God's language come back. Because as you know, <laughs> when God did the simulations to support that busy six-day period, she did all of that work in Fortran 77. <laughs> so at, at any rate, if, if you want to do all of this in Fortran, let me know. There, there's just a couple little things I need to tell you. The, the, the magic decoder ring to move from C to Fortran is really quite simple. And you, know, you could write your stuff and do everything in Fortran if, if you wanted to. It's just you have this directive syntax that you would use, and Bronis can tell you all about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So OpenMP, as we're using it right now, it's a multi-threaded programming model. It's going to create a bunch of threads, which are all going to do a bunch of work. Threads communicate by sharing variables. So this is different than MPI. MPI, you package thing into messages and move messages around. Here what you do is you have a whole bunch of threads that share an address space. And they interact by sharing variables, which is really, really wonderful. Well, it is, except every now and then, you get programs where the output of the program varies depending on how the threads are scheduled. And notice the detailed scheduling of the threads is up to the operating system, not up to you. So if you get different answers depending on how the operating system chooses to schedule your threads, you're screwed. The, the technical term for it is you are screwed. And and, and in less polite audiences, I might use a different word for screwed. But I think you all get the point. Okay, we call that a race condition. Now, here's a little story. <laughs> there was a large company whose name I won't give you. And this large company had a team doing what something called a threat immersion program. And what this large company was doing with threat immersion programs is they would invite commercial vendors to bring their multi-threaded commercial shipped code into them and they would help improve it. And they got dozens and dozens and dozens and these are commercially shipped codes that I am not allowed in any way to give you the names of, but if I did you would recognize them. And the result of this study was that every single one of those commercial multi-threaded programs without exception had race conditions. All right, this is the scary thing about multi-threaded programming is it is almost impossible for you, for a complex program to make sure you don't have a race condition, that you don't have an undisciplined mixture of reads and writes to a shared variable. So be very concerned about race conditions. And there are no tools that exist that can prove you do not have race conditions. There are very nice tools that help you make sure for the data set you're exploring, you don't have race conditions. But to know that in general, you have no Undisciplined ordering of mix of reads and writes is almost an impossibility. So race conditions are something to be very, very scared of. Uh, and just keep that in mind when you think about multi-threaded programming. All right, how do you get rid of race conditions? Well, you control your data environment, which we'll talk about, or you add synchronization constructs. And a synchronization construct lets you order reads and writes. And it lets you uh, order thread execution, but it lets you put ordering constraints in. But synchronization is very expensive. So if you can, by managing your data environment, minimize the amount of synchronization, your program runs really fast. And so this one slide is what we're going to do for much of today, is explain how each one of these works and how the constructs in OpenMP give the ability to handle all that. 
All right, so now, ha, let's go to the next stuff, creating threads. All right, so OpenMP is based on what we call the fork join model. And the idea is very simple. You have a master thread, and this is the initial thread that starts up when you begin your program. And on this slide, it's in red. And it cruises along through the code, and it comes to some point where extra threads could be useful. So then it's going to fork off a team of threads. The master thread will be part of the team, and it will be the thread that has ID equal to zero. So you're going to create a team of threads. Now that team of threads is going to go along and work and do stuff in parallel. And then when they're done, they're going to join back together. And then that one master thread, that initial thread, will continue. Until later on in the program, it sees another point where additional threads could help. And it'll create another team of threads. Notice that team of threads could be a different size. So the number of threads you create each time can vary, depending on what your needs are. All right. We call those parallel regions. And a region in OpenMP refers to the OpenMP you know, directive, the construct name, and all the code called inside of it. That's called a parallel region. And those areas in between are called sequential parts. And so your program becomes sort of like this, this string of pearls, you know, sequential parts with parallel regions. And you can even nest them. So inside that last parallel region there, one of the threads says, hey, you know, I would like to expose additional concurrency. I'm going to fork off an additional theme, team. All right, so this is the basic fundamental model behind the core of OpenMP, the fork join model. So let's go through exactly what a parallel region does. The only way to create threads in OpenMP is with a parallel region. I don't know if that's change with 4.0. <laughs> but you know, you got to have a parallel region or you're not going to get multiple threads. All right? So here I have a very simple program. Um, I have an array that I declare outside my parallel region. And I statically ask for 1,000 elements in that array. I then call a library function, OMP set num threads. And I request four threads. That's what that call, OMP set nums four does. Then I have pound pragma OMP parallel. I want to create a parallel region. So inside of there, I call a function int id equals OMP get thread num. That returns an identifier for each thread. And then I call my function poo with uh, id and that array. Now, I really want to pound this in and, uh, and, and make sure we understand exactly how that executes. So here I reproduce up in that corner. I reproduce the original code. So let's go through and think about the code and exactly what happens. So in the parallel region, if all I've put is the parallel region, what I want you to internalize is each thread redundantly executes the code in the parallel region. All right? So in this case, I've asked for four threads. Let's assume it gave me four threads. It doesn't have to give you the number of threads you ask. It could have given me less. It'll never give me more. Let's assume it gave me four threads. And then I had that int id. So I'm going to get id set to 0, 1, 2, and 3. And notice I declared id inside the parallel region. So each thread is going to create a copy of a variable called id. And it's going to create it on the thread's stack. So it has a private copy of the variable id. But the array a was declared outside the parallel region. So it goes on to that shared memory heap that all the threads are looking at. So a is shared between all the threads. So now in, when each thread calls that function poo, they're each going to call it with their own value of id, but they're all going to be looking at the same array a. All right. Then when it's done, all the threads are going to wait until everyone finishes. And then the one original thread will go on, and we'll get that print statement. This seems very slow, and I'm belaboring this very carefully. But I need to make sure that you all understand this concept very clearly. So what I need to see, before we get to questions, what I need to see is head nods. Does everyone get this? Okay, All head nods. I'm looking around the room. You're not nodding your head. Do you get it? You in the red there. Do you get it? Yeah. Okay, good. You weren't nodding your head. 
When I ask for head nods, I need to see head nods. OK, good. Now, are there any questions? There were two questions, or three. Wow, you had, you had your hand up first. Yes. So before we call this pragma, uh, we declare this uh, an array of uh, A. Is it declared by a single thread? Uh, and after that, we get like different threads when we call So I declared the variable A, the array A, and it was called in the sequential part. So there's only one thread at that point. It's only one thread declared this. And so it declared that array, and it's going into the shared memory, the heap, that all the threads can see. So if you think about the architecture of an operating system, you have a process. The process defines a region of memory typically managed as a heap. And that region of memory belongs to the process. Now that process will create a number of threads. And all of those threads see that same heap. Now, each one of those threads also has its own little piece of memory that belongs just to the thread, which is managed as a stack. So each thread has its own little stack, and all the threads share the heap. Now, I'm just giving you information about how every operating system I know of organizes this. There's nothing in OpenMP that says they have to use a stack or a heap or any of that stuff. What OpenMP says, though, is each thread needs to have a little piece of memory that belongs to the thread. And it's a shared address space met model. So each thread has to be able to see this shared address space. All right? So since A was declared before the parallel region in the serial part, I'm declaring that array. And it's going into that shared address space. I then create the threads. And now each thread redundantly says, hey, create a variable named ID and call this function to give it a value. That happens because the declaration is inside the parallel region. That is executed by each thread, and that ID goes on the thread stack. So ID declared inside the parallel region is local to each thread. Each thread has its own copy. All right, But the array A declared in the serial part outside the parallel region, all the threads can see that. It's a shared address space. Question in the back. Yeah, um, two actually. So when you call OpenMP setting on threads, is that creating a thread pool? Or is when you do the parallel, is that the, are the threads created on the fly right. up to that number? Right. OK. So the question is about how the OMP set num threads works. So let me try and explain. OpenMP is a standard that works across, across a wide variety of hardware. When you work on standards, you're always very, very careful to distinguish what does the standard have to define and what should the standard leave to an implementation to do whatever it wants. All right? So OpenMP doesn't stipulate exactly what happens when you do that OMP set num threads. Right? Now, let me tell you what happens. Right? There's an internal control variable that keeps track of what's the default number of threads. All OMP set num threads does is change that internal control variable. It tells the systems, next time I'm going to ask for a bunch of threads, a team of threads, this is how many I want. That's all that function does. It sets that internal control variable. Now you hit that parallel. That's when the threads are created. So, and if the runtime is going to manage that with the thread pool, which I think all of them do, it's going to create the thread pool at that point. Now, if there are, let's say that's not the first parallel region, that's a latter parallel region, it will go back to an existing thread pool and pull that out. But I hope you can appreciate that's an implementation detail the spec doesn't define. So an implementation could, if it wants, completely destroy the threads at the end of a parallel region and completely create threads from scratch at the beginning of every parallel region. That could be completely conformant with an implementation if that's what it chose to do. But typically, the threads, the very first parallel region, that's when the thread pool is created. And then it moves on from there. OK? Now you add your question. I'm going over there. Then we may come back to you. Yes? Uh, OpenMP set num threads, the number has to be a constant, or it can be variable? OK. OMP set num threads. He asked, does it have to be a constant, or can it be a variable? It can be an in any integer expression. It does not have to be a constant. So it happens so at runtime. OMP set num threads, it happens at runtime. So let me be really clear. There are 
features of OpenMP that happen when the code is compiled. That's what the directives do. You know, how do we sit down and decide what goes in a library, what goes in a directive? All right, there are things that just happen in the directive because they're telling the compiler, you need to do this. So then there are things that happen at runtime. And that's what those library routines do. I glossed over it really quick, but let me just mention Pragma OMP parallel num threads. I can, as a clause, make that request. All right, it does the same thing as calling the function. I just didn't want to go into too much detail with it. Nope, integer expression. Integer expression. Now, I, you know what? I, I don't want to go into too much detail at that point. So hold that thought, we'll come back. It's an integer expression. But every thread better get the same value. Is there a way, is, it, is there um, a library call that will figure out how many cores I have on, if I have? Yes, yes, we will, we will get to that. So, so later on, I will give you a list of the library calls that people use all the time. All right. So you had a question back there? Yeah, in Fortran, I cannot easily define a variable inside the parallel region. Right. So I have to declare that as private. This is the only way? Or? So um, the question is pertaining to Fortran. So how many of you are going to be doing this course in Fortran as opposed to C? Just two of you, three of you, four of you. Briefly, <laughs> and you guys with the four, you folks doing the Fortran, you write this down, because I don't want I don't want to go back and delay uh, uh, again and again and again. My advice to C and C++ programmers, do it this way. If you have a variable that you want to use that's private to a thread, declare it inside the parallel region. Just stick to doing it that way for now. Fortran programmers are blessed. <laughs> they can't do that, okay? They have to declare all their variables up top, okay? So if you need a variable that's just inside the parallel region, you're going to put a clause called private, P-R-I-V-A-T-E, open parentheses, a list of variables. And it will create a private copy of that list of variables for each one of the threads, all right? So... But I don't want to go there for everyone else, because later on, we're going to go through private, shared, first private, last private, all of that class of variables. But you Fortran programmers, you can't do anything without this. So you need to know about the private. So far, we, we've been writing programs. But the only synchronization that you're using is when the parallel region ends, all of the threads are done. You're guaranteed that once you get outside of the parallel region, all of the threads have finished their work. You essentially have a barrier at the end of that parallel region. All right, but OpenMP provides many different mechanisms for synchronization. And so this lists most of them. There, there are ones that have been added since uh, when this was put together that are, are really relevant to um, tasking. And I think we cover those later. To begin with, we're going to focus just on critical and atomic, which are probably the two most basic uh, of the synchronization mechanisms. Barrier and order are also pretty basic. All right, so what does a critical do? It creates a critical region that you're guaranteed that only one thread at a time is going to execute it. If we put critical down here before we get to this statement, we're guaranteed that only one thread is at a time is ever executing that statement. Plus equal operator says, read this thing, get this value, add them together, and then store it back into there. All right, so you're actually accessing res twice. All right, and if you don't put any synchronization in there, you could have one thread read this, have it compute this, have another thread read that same value, compute this, and then have the first thread store it, and then have the second thread store it. So you have a race. You're going to get only one, the, the, you're going to only end up adding the result of consume B once instead of twice. So if you instead put it in a critical region, you're guaranteed that all of, all of the accesses by one thread happen before the accesses of another thread. The other thing that, you, that we're going to talk about right now is the atomic construct. 
So atomic is exactly like critical, except that critical, you can put a whole lot of statements into a critical region, all right, and have them all be ordered relative to other threads. Atomic says, I'm only going to put one statement in there, and I'm only going to order the accesses to the thing, to the shared memory, to the shared data that is being accessed atomically. So here, if B were outside of here and it was shared and I wrote into B, I would not get atomic access. All right. Here, it's a private copy. And B is private, so it's OK. I'm not going to get any, any shared accesses in here. And they're going to just read the value of x and then write the sum into x as one operation. That, that's the key thing to know that this is the difference between critical and atomic. All right? So atomic is lighter weight because you're only guarding, only synchronizing the accesses to that one shared object. Everything else can happen in any order. All right? And that, but that's also where you can trip up. If you, your other things, if the order between threads of your other uh, the other parts of your statement matters, then you don't want to use atomic. We, we've said you get to carve up the iterations of the loop yourself, all right? That you have to step through so that the loop is stepping at something other than stride one, other than one at a time through each iteration, all right? And so you had to go in and modify your sequential code, your original uh, Pi program, so that it had a different step. All right? And you got to say, gee, this seems very mechanical. All right? And so the underlying philosophy, really, ultimately in, in OpenMP is, is one of separation of concerns. So Tim mentioned that OpenMP has been expanding the, the space of node level parallelism that it addresses. All right? But throughout that, that expansion, we've tried to maintain a very basic philosophy of the, all the things that are mechanical but easy to get wrong are done by the compiler. And all of the things that are hard for a compiler to, to go through and analyze and say, you know, oh, I see, you're not, you don't have any conflicting accesses here. Or, you know, um, gee, uh, well, that's the easiest one. There, but anything where you're asking the compiler to go and figure out some property of your code instead of just mechanically changing how your code works so it has parallelism in it, we say you have to guarantee that. All right? But the, the transformation of changing the step, that's pretty mechanical. Right? With parallel, it, it's going to just simply say, do all of this work redundantly. Every thread is going to do exactly the same thing. All right, and so the only differences you make in it are by calling into OpenMP runtime calls that give you a different result based on the, the thread number. So you got a difference in that code by calling OMP get thread num. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gotten the right answer. All right, so how are you going to go and, and split these up within a team of threads here? All right, the most common way is through work sharing constructs, and in particular, the loop construct. All right, we also have sections constructs and single constructs. And you can also use tasking to divide up the work amongst the threads. Right now, we're going to cover the loop construct. And so this is a pretty simple construct. You start your parallel region, and then you say, oh, I have a loop, and I want to have that divided across the threads. I want to have it work shared. And so you just put an o OMP4 there, and it says, go ahead, share it across the threads. And automatically divide the iteration space up across the threads and do it in a way that works correctly. So for example, here, L is going to be private to each thread. So you don't have to worry about that. If you access L here, you get a shared L. But in here, you want a private L. There was our sequential code up amongst threads.
using just the parallel. And here's what I do now that I have the loop construct. I just say, share it amongst the threads, right? So I, I went from sequential, lots of mechanical work, to parallel. All right, again, it's mechanical. So the compiler is easily able to figure out how to do that for you. The question that isn't addressed in all that is, how is this iteration space divided across the threads? All right, here you have complete control. All right, um, all right, here, the way this is shown, all right, I'm dividing it into chunks. So the nice thing about that is now, all right, when, when I go and I access A sub I, all right, I've chunked it up so that thread zero gets zero through some number, then thread one gets one after that through twice that, basically, right? And so I've given it a bunch of chunks. So I'm not getting false sharing in my accesses to A here, except for maybe right at the boundaries. All right? But I can divide it up any way I want if I use the hand way of dividing it. And there may be other divisions of the iterations that work better for me. Again, all of those are going to be mechanical. Well, some of them, if you get complex enough, it might be mechanical, but very hard for the compiler to know. But there are a number of possible divisions that you would want that are still mechanical, and it's clear that, in that many different codes would do better using them. All right. So for this reason, OpenMP has this concept of a schedule. All right. And so you can put a schedule clause on a uh, loop construct to say, divide the um, iterations up in this way. All right. So the, the most commonly used one is probably static. All right. It's very low overhead. So with static, the compiler can figure out ahead of time how to divide the chunks, how to divide the iterations amongst the threads. All right. So if we don't specify a chunk, it's going to give, divide the iterations into, at most, n threads chunks and give each thread at most one chunk. All right. Now, why do I say at most and at most? Well, Suppose I have 10 threads and 9 iterations. All right. Well, then I can't have 10 chunks, right? Because I, I have 9 chunks, each of one iteration, and there is no iteration remaining. So you're actually guaranteed that if you don't specify a chunk, that the iterations will be divided as evenly as possible across the different threads. All right. Alternatively, you could divide it, you could specify a chunk size. All right. Now, and if you have enough iterations, what's going to happen is thread zero will get some chunk, get, get the first chunk, thread one will get the next chunk, and so on until you've run out of threads, and then the next chunk will go to thread zero, and so on. And there's some caveats there. You're not actually guaranteed that it deals them out first to thread zero, it could deal them out in some relatively arbitrary order, but you're guaranteed that they, again, that the chunks get divided and, and parceled out amongst the thread evenly. And most compilers are going to do it starting from zero and, and on. All right. Um, alternatively, you can say, I want to use a dynamic schedule. All right. So static works really well if, if the work per iteration is relatively constant across different iterations, all right? Because that means that you're going to divide your, your, your work across your threads evenly, all right? But what if the work in each iteration varies greatly, all right? And suppose, you know, your first the first half of your iterations have a lot of work, and you have almost no work in the second half of your iterations. 
Well, you could try and specify a chunk size in that case and just divide it up amongst the number of threads. But what if it's not such a simple pattern? All right. Well, now how are you going to get that work evenly divided across the threads? So what you can do instead is use a dynamic schedule. All right. And so what that says is take the, the iterations, divide them into chunks. And if you don't specify a chunk size, the size is 1. So static and dynamic are exactly opposite in their default for what your chunk size is. Take those iterations, assign them to threads, and when a thread gets done, assign it the next chunk. All right? And so you're just going to dynamically deal out the chunks to threads as they finish their last piece of work. All right? And so that will get you good load balance, but that means that the compiler can't figure out ahead of time which chunk is going to go to which thread, all right? which means that the OpenMP implementation has to include in the OpenMP runtime a mechanism to go and do that assignment, all right? which is going to actually involve some synchronization. So there's going to be overhead to that. In fact, many OpenMP implementations have a lot of overhead for using dynamic. And the smaller your chunk size is, the more overhead you're going to get. All right? which leads to the next schedule that OpenMP has, guided. All right? And guided basically takes your iterations and divides them up into blocks of iterations like dynamic and assigns them off at runtime. But it starts by using larger blocks of iterations, and it decays down to no smaller than what your chunk size is. All right, then there are two other schedules. One is runtime. Auto has been there. It got put in basically at the time I started working on the OpenMP language committee. Uh, I'm not really clear on why we have auto, because if I don't specify a schedule clause, what schedule do you get? Yeah, you get auto. A lot of people think you get static. But in fact, the OpenMP specification says nothing, which means you get whatever the compiler chooses to do, which is what auto is. So, yeah. I've kind of already said all of this stuff. So static is nice, because it's, it's pre predetermined, and you can tell basically exactly how the iterations are going to get divided up. Dynamic, you can tell how they're going to get divided up, but you can't tell which thread is going to execute what. All right. Um, and then the others are kind of, so guided, as I said, is, is a sort of an optimization of dynamic. And auto, you don't really know what's going to happen because the compiler can do anything it wants. OpenMP has a convenience uh, directive called the combined parallel loop construct. All right? So because this pattern is so common, Right? Rather than having to write pound pragma OMP parallel, pound pragma OMP 4, you can just write pound pragma OMP parallel 4. Do that. And it's identical. And there's, there's like one or two very small caveats. Um, and in particular, it has to do with uh, last private, which you cannot specify on parallel. And so you then can't specify that on the combined one. So, if your code is mostly loop-oriented, you can generally just look for your, your compute-intensive loops, make sure that, they're that the iterations of that loop are independent, so you can execute them in any order. Remember, so what are we doing when, when we say use the loop construct? We're saying assign these across threads and execute them, and we're not doing anything to order those, ex those iterations. All right? And then, Go ahead and, and parallelize it. So here's a very simple one, right? This loop is looking at J, and it's using, right? The value of J depends on which iteration I'm in. So what do you do? Well, you just turn it into something that figures out what J is from I rather than as you sequentially go along. It's a lot easier to write j plus equals 2. But this, func this expression over here is equivalent, right? 
So, you, but you have to do that, otherwise you can't execute, right? That you'd have to do those updates to J in the order, in the sequential order. Well, another very common pattern in, in code is going to be where you have doubly or triply nested loop. Sometimes even more deeply nested. Originally in OpenMP, how would you get all of these iterations to execute in parallel? Right? You had a couple different choices. You could put the parallel on here, which doesn't exactly do it, because right? you're going to be creating the parallel region, executing a bunch of iterations in parallel, finishing that parallel region, creating the next parallel region. All right? You're still kind of getting them all in parallel, but you're, you're kind of going along and changing back and forth between them. Or you would have to go and turn this into a single loop where you have in indexed by something like ij, and you then, in here, pull apart. Right? There's actually a, a well-defined expression to, to get back i and j. All right? Well, that combining the, the two for loops into a single for loop is, again, very mechanical and also very painful. Right? It, I, I'd like to see anybody raise their hand to say that they would prefer to do it by hand. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure no one would, right? So what we did is in uh, OpenMP 3.0, we added the collapse clause. All right? And the collapse clause says, I have these perfectly nested loops. Treat them as a single loop compiler and go and make it work. Um, Right now, there are actually are restrictions on that, which some of which I, I, I have been trying to convince the implementers to get rid of. Like, for instance, you cannot say J equals I. All right. Why? Yeah, there's no, that makes no sense. That's why I've been trying to convince the implementers to get rid of this restriction. They're just lazy. Yeah. Well, you, you get into some very strange arguments with, with, with compiler implementers sometimes, where they'll tell you things are impossible, and you're like, this is simple math. You, you should be able to do this. And, and, and triangular loops are, are very common. So, so that's one where it's really painful. Yeah? Is there a performance trade-off in, in assuming a same compiler? Absolutely. The performance trade-off is, as in most things with shared memory programming, very complicated. All right, And knowing the best way to do it is oftentimes not really clear. Generally, this is going to be better, all right, because you're going to tell the compiler, basically, here's all the parallel work. Divide it up in whatever sensible way you can. All right? Um, but there may be times where the compiler doesn't divide it up the best way. And it may be hard for you to get a schedule that does. So you may end up with either nested parallelism or just in parallelism on, on one or the other loops. All right. So over there first. Is there support for range-based for loops, C++ 11? Range-based for loops. Or iterators in general, even. Uh -huh. So there is support for iterators. Um, they have to be, um, I, think, I think it's, so, so I'm not, I'm not the, the best C++ e expert. I believe it's random access iterators. You basically, the, the iterator has to provide a mechanism by which the compiler knows how to calculate the number of iterations that will be occur in the loop prior to the loop executing. So if you can do that, in general, then the loop can be, uh, you, can, you can use it in, in a loop construct. If you come upon ones in C++ where you say, the compiler should know ahead of time what the trip count is, and, we, and our restrictions prevent it, let us know, because Generally, we're trying, we try and not have those in there, but it's, again, it's, it's, it's like this one where I'm saying, well, the compiler knows if I make it j equals i. You get into these arguments where they're like, well, but no, the compiler knows. 
Uh, let's see, over there next. Um, the two for loops have to be adjacent statements or they can be something between inside the first for loop and then after some time start the second for loop? They must be perfectly nested. Perfectly nested means no code can appear here. All right, because what you're saying is don't treat this as two iteration spaces, treat it as a single iteration space. If I put any code here, then I have two iteration spaces because I only execute this code for some of the combined iterations. So that's, that's why that restriction is there. That restriction is, is necessary. Some of the other ones, like I said, we could probably get rid of. Um, you were next. So the, um, is there a workaround for wanting to write int i or j equal to i? Or do you then actually have to? Um, yes, but I'm not remembering it. And, it's, it's, and it is not something that is not painful. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the, a simple one w would be to basically start here by basically saying if j is, is less than i. Yeah. It's nasty. Not. I mean, it, it, if nothing else, you you are having to insert a bunch of extra work in there that that's completely useless. Um, as I said, it's one. The more people that can tell their compiler vendor that they have triangular loops that they want to thread, the better. Because so the most frequent reason that, that things are not in OpenMP is not because it's hard, it's because they don't think that there's justification for implementing the code in their compiler to support it. So it's too nice. It is because compiler vendors are inherently lazy because anything they add, they have to support. So if the user base isn't cracking the whip, they won't add it. He's, he's uh, a little bit, so, so maybe I'm nicer. I, I have a deeper understanding, perhaps, of the issue. It's, it's less the, the uh, implementing it. It's more the testing of it. So the more things you put in there, the more things they have to test, and the more they have to test it in various, you know, all possible combinations of the ways you could use it. And, you know, because OpenMP operates on three different base languages, there's a, there are a lot of different ways you can use things. And every time we add something, I, I'm amazed by, um, well, in particular, the guy that's doing the GCC implementation about how he comes back with edge cases that would never occur to a normal human being. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but it's scary. And, and you look at it and you go, well, um, yeah, we have to address that. What, what should happen there, right? So that's, that's the problem is how do you specify it in such a way that it's well-defined and, and you don't have so many edge cases that it's, you don't take the compiler into something that we haven't defined what's supposed to happen. But a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, there was another question or two, uh, and then. So if if n is a lot greater than m, it's just gonna. Do, do you need to do that, and does it add extra overhead to do that? Because each of the processors is gonna do that loop, and it's gonna be all parallel. Right. Anyway. Right. So that is a very frequent time. You know, if. Again, if, if this work is easily divided up, you know, so a lot of times you might have a, 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 a loop that has multiple inner loops, right? And you could, if, if you know, this loop and, and the next loop are, are fully independent, you could then divide it yourself and then collapse it, right? But if, if this would really get you a big win, you might want to do that, if it got you a lot more performance. Typically, if your work divides nicely, statically, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. All right, so reductions. So this is a very common pattern in uh, parallel programs, right? That you're going to go and basically sum up across the loop. All right, we've sort of already seen this pattern today, right? So what do you do here? You really can't just come up with some expression in terms of i 
alone, right, that in, in terms of only private variables for, for what average is, all right? So, well, this is called, as it says here, a reduction. So uh, you really need some sort of support for that. So in OpenMP, we have the reduction clause, all right? And you just basically say, um, with this operator, combine the values of these variables, of these shared variables. And you get a private copy of each variable, and you add them up, and boom, you get the answer you want. So here we just say plus on average. And what happens is all of this stuff here is being done on a private copy that the compiler creates for you. And then at this point, the compiler takes the shared variable average and adds in the private copies for you. All right? And it has well-defined rules for that. Yes? Does the reduction class only work for parallel for? So, no. It works for parallel. It works for four. I believe it works for sections. And that may be it. No, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. No, it works with, yeah, I think it interacts with tasks in a natural way, but I don't know. No. It doesn't? No, I, I'm quite certain that you cannot do a reduction on tasks. Because that's something that we'll be adding in 5.0. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, How does it do the reduction? How does it do the reduction? Well, oh, you mean, how does it implement it? Um, that is an implementation detail. Uh, and the answer, you know, without being flippant, is hopefully it does it the most efficient way for the number of threads you're using and the architecture on which you're running. All right? There's no guarantee of that. It does it so you get the right answer. That's what you're guaranteed. All right. And the right answer has, so what, what do the private copies get initialized to? That's, a, that's an important question, right? Remember, we, we had to initialize the private values of sum, and we initialized them to 0. And we did that because we were doing a sum reduction, right? But what if we were doing? a multiplication, a product for the reduction. Well, then we would want it to be initialized to 1. All right. So OpenMP has several predefined value, predefined operators for C, C++, and Fortran. And we state what the initial values are. And you'll just have to take my word for it. You can think about it. They're all the right ones. Um, and that's because in, in you know, think about it, in your thread, you're, you're sitting there and you're doing this operation on that private value. And then you're doing that operation into the shared value. 